Moonflower is brought to you by NexusDigitalComics.com. Moonflower, Episode 3, Angel of Death. The wind had begun to pick up, whipping around brick corners. It surged through the city for the unnatural chill of my skin. The ephemeral breeze tensed against my reality and threaded through my body, weaving me into the background. The feeling of detachment bit into me. Sounds began to constitute themselves in the foreground of my consciousness as tires slid along wet pavement. The city began to hum and I was slightly comforted in the familiar murmur of the night society. Inhaling the nectar that lingered in the air, I forced out a rational disbelief, laughing at myself for what my imaginations could devise. Other reality was an illusion that must have climbed out of the stress I suffered from surviving the gunshot. My friend betrayed me and I was merely in shock. I followed my feet with little thought to where they were taking me and when the question surfaced I found myself curiously lost. Ahead of me a verbal tiff spilled onto the streets as several suits used their stern statues to force an average dressed man out of a hole in the wall. I stepped through their quarrel and made my way to a seat at the bar. With a simple head shake the bartender expressed his concerns and my memory jolted into action. I smiled hesitantly and removed myself from the stool. Still clad in a stolen doctor's frock I had no money and no identity. With some convincing, however, I was able to use the bar's phone. Having no one else to help me, I bitterly slid the dial to code in Noah's number. His voice was overburdened, but agreed to meet me at the bar. My best friend, the man who shot me, drove his 38 DeSoto sedan into the heart of the city. He continues to mock me with his trophies. The checks I wrote him paid for that automobile. Still, watching the glossy shine of metal pull up under the street lamps was comforting. As he emerged, he was met with a series of angry slurs as the less-than-tolerant patron sneered at his suit and his car. Their racism forced a kind of guilt within me. Noah, who had learned to ignore the ignorant, greeted me with the gesture he uses when he wants to convey sorrow. In light of the fools around him, I find myself obliged to offer him a comforting smile in return. It's startling how easy it is for me to forgive a man who mortally betrayed me by simply sharing a few glasses of house whiskey. The comforting heat it offered made the conversation easier. I did, however, notice that while Noah had become effectively drunk with the passing hour, I had no more than a light haze. Uncomfortably, I hid the possibility in a joking tone. I can't get drunk because my blood's not flowing to the brain. That thought provoked the elephant in the room to speak up. In a conversation that seemed far too easy to have, I dealt with the fact that I was, indeed, dead, the bullet hole still glowing. Noah shot me to protect those he employed, Angela included and the only possibility for my resurrection was his late night prayer to remove the day from the flow of time. With realization drinking alongside, it became clear to me. The conversation was easy in bulk because such concerns of betrayal for a cause and mortality were of no more concern to me. What now do I have to burden myself with? Around us, the bar had gathered an aura of anger as the others began questioning our motives. A black man in a pristine suit and a naked white man having a heart-to-heart -heart over aged whiskey? These were grounds for a fearful mob against interracial homosexuality. Beer bottles broke into shards of shivs and their demand for us to leave were muffled by their angered desire for retribution. Noah tried to explain our situation, excluding the bits involving a gun and resurrection. I, however, had decided to finally embrace my new stature and unbutton my frock revealing everything. With God's work in full view, the men were fixated on my glowing portal into another reality. I'm the angel of death, I called out in exuberant delight. And in drunk confusion and adding blasphemy to the tally of misdemeanors, a man in a white work shirt lunged at me. The glass dug in and released the blue light within me. Glass has the defect of being sharp on all edges, however, and his palm began to bleed. My bullet wound began pulsing feverishly, and I watched as the light from the new wound gathered his blood like a series of glowing serpents and stitched the wound together. That was gross, I said, turning to Noah, who looked like he was ready to vomit. With that, I cloaked myself and pulled Noah out the door. As the day in confusion came to a rest, I wondered which version of a fairy tale I was trapped in. Comforted in the smooth ride back to my home in Noah's car, I tried to remember all the folklores I used to study in school. With far many to sift through, I resigned to the option of creating a new one all my own. The rainbow crow, however, flew into mind once more. The thought of returning, completely changed, lingered in the winds, and I shuddered at what the future held for me.